She is Dr. Ramya. So I am the moderator for this session, and she is the co-convener co for this session. Okay. So please stick to the time if possible, and don't rush through because even we also have to understand what you want to emphasize on, and please try to emphasize more on the results and discussions because that is more important for us. And what is your conclusion of the study? And try to stick to the time if feasible because there are other speakers also. But if you shoot a bit, 30 seconds and all, it's okay. It's cool for us. Not an issue. So you are Dr. Nitish Kumar Marshall. Okay. So you are presenting on prevalence of dry eye in type 2 diabetic patients and its association with diabetic retinopathy. Yeah. You can start. Yeah. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. No final, there is no financial disclosure. Introduction. Diabetic mellitus is presently a major public health problem. It will affect 380 million people worldwide by 2025. A studies have reported the prevalence of dry eye disease in diabetic is up to 54.3%. Symptoms of dry eye are staring, severe cessation, burning cessation, itching, etc. Coronary lesion, which is reported in dry eye disease, a patient suffering from diabetes or superficial punctate creatopathy, coronary ulcer, and persistent epithelial defects. In our study to evaluate the prevalence of dry eye disease in type 2 diabetes and association with diabetic retinopathy at the care center of Jharkhand. A study is a hospital with cross section study. A study duration is a to do to the auditory study proposed 753 type 2 doctors, patients, or training the outpatient and patient department in the care center of Jharkhand. A study said low in search. In clinical criteria, patients over 30 years of age of IR6 with type 2 doctors are attending the outpatient and patient department in the care center of Jharkhand. Exclusion criteria was patients who are undergoing ocular surgery, contact loss order, patient or suspect medication such as antihistamines, tricyclic antidepressant, oral contraceptive patient with autoimmune disease like rheumatoid health. Arthritis, lupus, gross disease, Parkinson's, Asocos. After care, as per institutional ethics committee records with the guidelines of health care, taking written informed counsel and detailed history regarding duration of diabetes and the time was taken. Upon examination of the IOP was recorded, upon surface disease index cost number, while no solar test was performed, to field record to was performed, upon this examination of the after taking counsel, this picture shows sir. Scientist and TF film backup time. A statistical analysis was performed using SPSS version 22. The baseline characteristic of patient was presented as as one plus minus standard deviations. Results mean is mean age of the patient was 52.6 and plus minus 7.98 years. Most of the patients were between 40 to 55 years of age. The study was female preponderance. 60.1 percent was female. Male patient was 39.9 percent. 45.09 percent were dry positive and duration of diabetes was 5.50 plus minus 4.169 years. Diabetic retinopathy was found in 35.94 percent. In which mild NPDR was observed in 13.07 percent, moderate NPDR was observed in 17.65 percent, severe NPDR was observed in 5.22 percent. In this study, no percent was observed with very severe NPDR and PDR. Out of 153 patients, 98 patients have no association with diabetic retinopathy, 20 patients have mild NPDR, 27 patients have moderate NPDR, 8 patients have severe NPDR. This is shown by the price. 13.7% so are mild NPDR, 17.64% are mild NPDR, 5.22% are severe NPDR. Patient child score value 96.145A. A distribution in 31 to 50 years of age, total number of patients was 5 minutes, no of the symptoms of dry In age between 51 to 50 years, total number of patients was 17 years, 10 percent have the symptoms of dry eye. In age between 51 to 60 years, total number of patients was 54 years, 40 percent have the symptoms of dry eye. In in age more than 60 years, total number of patients are 24 women, 19 have the symptoms of dry eye. Six, uh, out of 61 women, 22 have the symptoms of dry eye. Out of 92 female, 37 have the symptoms of dry eye. Uh, out of 153, the patients said the main duration of diet was 5.50 plus 4.169. Main HB is 8.1. Uh, plus minus 1.60 zero mean is 52.69 plus minus 6 7.980 based on OSDI grading 25.8 percent had mild mild dry 15.9 percent and mild 3.3 percent is severe dry based on Sarma test 24.2 percent had mild 15 percent and mild 5.9 percent has severe uh, 
they are high. Based on ten out of getting thirty four percent are not promoted and thirteen percent have severe dry eye. Out of ninety eight uh, percent, which are no associated with active retinopathy, thirty three percent have the symptoms of dry eye. Out of fifty uh, five, out of out of fifty five. Out of 55 percent, who are associated with diabetic retinopathy, in which 36 have the symptoms of dry eye. Conclusion: In this study, the prevalence of dry eye was 45.09 percent. Diabetes dry eye appears to have common association. Dry eye was correlated directly with the duration of diabetes. Increased age was sign significant predictor of dry eye in patients with type 2 diabetes, but no sex. Dry eye in diabetes can be prevented by detecting and controlling the diabetes early. Discussion: Various studies have reported the prevalence of dry eye disease. Among diabetics ranging from 17.5 percent to 54.5 percent, Shepherd et al. found prevalence of dry to be 52.8 percent among those with type 1 and type 2 diabetes, and 9.3 percent among normal control su subjects. This is my reference, and thank you. Thank you, Nitish ji. It was a nice presentation, but uh, what I feel that you have not included any slide on the treatment. Like, do you think that any treat there is any difference in the treatment, the way we approach for a dry eye with the, uh, diabetes as a predisposing factor. So how would you treat that? Anything different or would you treat it as the same case as a dry eye which you always approach in an OPD? So how would you approach it, approach it for treatment? Always we should always include a treatment slide also. Although it might be common, but it should always be included. Okay, so how would you treat that? Just let, uh, like stepwise, can you please elaborate? Mild, mild, mild dry, mild dry. Mm -hmm. Come, normal lubricants. So, carboxymethyl cellulose. So, normal. So, you'll go with the lubricants. Any uh, kind of lubricants, any classification of lubricants, or any particular type of lubricants you sodium, would prefer? So, sodium hyaluronate, ma'am. Directly sodium hyaluronate. You are saying mild dry, yeah, and then you are saying directly sodium hyaluronate. Mm -hmm. CMC drops would be sufficient. Yes, CMC. Okay. So what should be the uh, duration of follow-up for such cases? Duration of follow-up, ma'am, two weeks of follow-up. Two weeks of follow-up. Yes. Then after that? After that, dry, after that, thermal test was performed to assess the dry eyes. Okay. Mm. So depending upon the profession also, you should tighter your uh, classification of the dry eye and all because some people will be profession related who are be will be working on the screen time will be uh, yes. more and also 2020 rule also should be emphasized to them. Yes. Quite emphasis on lubricant should be there and lifestyle modification should be there. So a slide on treatment would have been good. Yes. Okay, rest all it was very nice. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And Nitish, just a suggestion, don't run, okay? Unnecessary slides, you can just cut it off. You don't need to read everything in the slide. You have practiced 100 times, I know that. So just emphasize on the important points. So this should be beneficial for you in the future, okay? Yeah. So our next presenter is Dr. Bhavya Khadri. She'll be presenting on comparative analysis of dry eye questionnaire and ocular surface disease index in dry eye symptoms. Just a minute. Uh, sir, we don't have a timer here. Timer ne kam kar raha hai. 060504. minutes mein hai? Okay, okay, okay. Fine. Good morning, Vananda. I am Dr. Bhavya. Today I'm here to present my topic on comparative analysis of dry eye questionnaire and ocular surface disease index in assessing dry eye symptoms. My financial disclosure in this paper was nil. To begin with, dry eye disease is a common multifactorial ocular surface disease with prevalence of 14.5%. In order to evaluate dry eye disease, a short questionnaire which is a sensitive and a repetitive tool is required for large epidemiological research studies and clinical research. The ocular surface disease index is a 12 item questionnaire that uses three subscales to assess the dry eye symptoms, mainly ocular symptoms, visual related function and environmental triggers. The dry eye questionnaire consists of five questions that assess the following, frequency of watery eye, discomfort and dryness that is scaling from a zero to four, late day discomfort and dryness that is scaling from zero to five, 
Our aim is to evaluate the effectiveness of the ocular surface disease index and RIA questionnaire 5 in non-clinical population. Objectives to compare the DEQ5 and OSDI questionnaire in terms of their validity and reliability in assessing dry eye symptoms, to assess the sensitivity of DEQ5 in comparison to OSDI, and to assess the correlation between DEQ5 and OSDI. Ours is a cross-sectional study with 55 patients uh, uh, with, sam uh, with study duration of three months and convenient sampling technique was followed. Informed consent and institutional ethical clearance was taken. All individuals uh, more than 18 years of age were included and uh, ocular inflammation or uh, infection or any other previous ocular surgeries based on self-reported medical history were excluded from the study. These are two validated questionnaires of dry eye symptoms were taken that is OSDI and DQ5 and the data was calculated using these two questionnaires. The data was analyzed using Microsoft Excel. Descriptive statistics for continuous variables are represented as means and standard deviation along with a 95% confidence interval. The association between both the questionnaires was compared using bland Altman plot. And the Pearson correlation was done for uh, continuous variables. Reliability was uh, assessed uh, using Cronbach solver. And sensitivity of the both the questionnaires were assessed using receiver operative curve and area under curve. Our results, the age distribution main of our sample lies with uh, mean of uh, 53 and standard deviation of 12 with 95% confidence interval of 50 to 57 with the male to female uh, sex uh, distribution of uh, 1.2 is to 1. OSD score has mean of 68 with a standard deviation 14 with the 64 to 72 of 95% confidence interval and the DEQ5 score has a mean of 12 with a standard deviation of 2 with 95% confidence interval of 11.96 11 to 13.42. And the PSN correlation which revealed uh, of the value of 0 0.6 shows a high correlation between the two questionnaires. This is a scatter plot representing the agreement between the OSDI and DQ5 questionnaire with upper limit of agreement of 80 and lower limit of agreement of 12 with bias of 55. And the Cronbach's alpha of OSDI is 0 0.78 while that of the DQ5 is 0 0.52 which shows uh, that OSDI has good reliability when compared with DQ5. And the receiver operative curve of OSDI has a cutoff score of 68 with sensitivity of 0.78 and area under curve of 0.9. The cutoff score is a point where there is a maximum sensitivity with the minimal uh, false positive reads. And the ROC curve of DQ5 has cutoff score of 15 with sensitivity of 0.34 with area under curve of 0.7. Discussion. Samra et al. Uh, published a journal in Indian Journal of Ophthalmology concluded that patients with negative OSDI score should also be reassessed with DEQ5 to exclude symptom positivity. And Zeri et al. Uh, published a uh, journal in Transitional Vision Science and Technology concluded that modified sheen questionnaire is rapid to administer and, sc and score uh, compass well with the OSDI for test efficacy. And our study, which was done in Alu Sitaram Raju Institute of Medical Sciences, Andhra Pradesh, has limitations of uh, that the patients of this study were sampled from small area with the, which might not reflect the whole population. The results may not affect the applicability of findings to the individuals from other races and ethnicity. The exclusion criteria is assessed by observation and self-reported history, which might not uh, be the most accurate. Conclusion of our study, OSDI has good reliability and sensitivity in comparison with the DQ5 score in evaluating dry eye symptoms in dry eye settings. These are my references. Thank you. Have you heard of Dew's classification of dry eye? Dew's, D-E-W-S. Dry eye workshop. Huh. So classification, can you tell us? Level one, level two, yes, level three. Level one, uh, uh, we go with, we first we assure the patient that the symptoms are uh, relieved but not the causative, causative agent for the dry eye is uh, not fully treated and in 11-1 we ask the patient to have compliance with the treatment and uh, to be in uh, low humid climate conditions and we ask the patient to have lid hygiene in level 1. In level 2 we go with uh, uh, preservative, uh, preservative free lubricants any punctal plugs and in level 3 we go for surgical procedures God therapy
next is uh, Dr. Darshana Ravi Kumar, who will be speaking on impact of eye care training program on knowledge, attitude, and practice of intensive care unit nurses. Good morning. My topic for today is impact of eye care training program on the knowledge, attitude and practice of intensive care unit nurses. We have no financial conflicts of interest. Eye care is the fundamental constituent for prevention of blindness. In the ICU, where life is in major distress due to severe systemic illness and injuries, patients are under life supportive measures including the CPAP and the positive pressure ventilation anesthetic agents all of them are going to impair the blink reflex and cause lag of thalmos ultimately leaving the ocular health compromised so minimal priority is given to eye care therefore the primary care provider or the nurse needs to be assessed regarding his or her skills to help improve eye care in patients who are admitted in the ICU our main aim of the study is to evaluate the ICU nurses of their knowledge, attitude and practice and to make a protocol for the eye care in an ICU setting and to assess its impacts. Though there were many studies done in this regard, most of them lacked in their sample size and very few studies were conducted in India. Coming to methodology, it was a prospective cross-sectional study conducted in MS Ramya Medical College for a period of four months from October 2022 to January 2023 with a sample size of 196 staff nurses. We included all the ICU nurses working in Ramya Hospital at present and excluded the nurses who declined to give consent for the survey. Moving on to the procedure, we had administered a questionnaire based data collection tool uh, which was a mixed type of questionnaire, both open and closed questions were given. And for the ease of conducting the training session, we had divided them into batch of 25 members. It was a training program which was a lecture based program and a demonstration of how ocular drugs need to be installed and how eye ointment was uh, supposed to be given and how eyelid taping was supposed to be done. Post training assessment was held after two weeks where 141 nursing staff participated and the data was analyzed using SPSS database tool. The results, the mean uh, age was 33 years and female staff were higher than the males. Majority of the nurses pursued a BSc in their nursing followed by 42% diploma and 2% MSE. The mean years of experience in the ICU was 7 years. Uh, the number of years of experience in ophthalmology department was very low with 89% having no experience, 9% having less than 1 year of experience and only 2% worked up to 1 year or more. Knowledge was assessed in terms of how familiar they were with the signs of recognition of an eye infection. 45% had prior knowledge of it and 14% could notice only after an ophthalmology referral was given and 41% were ignorant of the signs. And post training, 63% knew about recognizing how to, uh, how to recognize an eye infection. Before training, only 30% were able to assess dry eye and after the training, 69% were able to do dry eye assessment. In view of eye taping, 79% were unaware prior to the tra training, while 67% came to know of it following the session. With respect to attitude, questions were based on what were the factors preventing adequate eye care. Most of them submitted to the fact that they had lack of knowledge, followed by it was not an important job and remaining proportion of nurses felt there was either lack of time or too much work or too much documentation. So the discussion, in our current study, 63% of nurses had poor knowledge about eye care in the ICU initially. So previous studies of Fashafshi et al. and Algamdi et al. also reported poor knowledge, whereas Vyas et al. and Khalil et al. reported sound knowledge of nurses. Only 21% of participants had good practice, which was consistent with the findings of Lamy et al., Fashafshi et al. and Khalil et al. 59% felt eye care was not an important job, that is it had a negative attitude which was reinforced by Gamla Mohamed et al. The results had increased significantly post intervention and overall the training program was able to improve the clinical capability of ICU nurses to provide adequate eye care to the ICU patients. So eye care among the intensive care nursing staff is suboptimal. So with a structured eye care training program, we can improve the knowledge, attitude and practice among the ICU nurses. 
we can reduce the incidence of avoidable blindness and win the love and gratitude of the patients and caregivers. These are my reference. Thank you. When was the, for how long was the training conducted? Uh, for four months, ma'am. For four months? For four months. And when was this uh, assessment conducted immediately uh, after training? Uh, for after two weeks we had conducted, ma'am. First we after had conducted in October. Okay. So after the training session, uh, since the ICU nurses have had so many shifts, morning, afternoon, and evening okay. shifts, mm -hmm. so that's why we divided them into batches. Uh, so after two weeks uh, we had given a lecture. I had given a lecture on uh, what are the signs of recognizing an eye infection. And uh, after the lecture, we had a demonstration class also separately because yes. most of them were uh, applying the uh, eye, eye taping very wrongly. They were. Uh, and after uh, the class, the questionnaire or whatever. The same questionnaire were repeated. Immediately. So, uh, after after uh, two to three weeks. Yeah. Usually, what happens is whenever we give a, a coaching to somebody, yes. they'll remember it for a period of ah, one or two weeks. weeks. Yes. If you conduct after six months or one year. They'll forget everything. They'll forget. Same thing happens everywhere. Yes. Okay. So post session after three weeks we had conducted. Okay. Good presentation. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. because it was uh, nurses so the basic training we wanted them to understand so that once they detect and refer to ophthalmologists we'll take over and uh, Basically, assist them properly. Basically I feel that a torch light, torch -light examination, examination for screening it's very important it's very mm -hmm. essential for them to know the torch light examination to know the things from the torch light itself to know which are on the emergency basis and which needs to be referred to the ophthalmologist. Yes, we had taught them the basic ma'am so they only knew whether the pupil was dilated or not uh, they were not able to tell no, Before I think that. that's what I feel that the emphasis should be there on the pupillary no. reflexes also. They should know the different kinds of pupils because in an ICU setup, all these different all kinds these of pupils yeah. play a very important role. Yeah, Thank you. Thank you. by Dr. Shreya Pai, who will be presenting a case of intradermal nevus in the right eye. Uh, good morning, everyone. So my paper for today is a case report of intradermal nevus in the right eye. So coming to the introduction, uh, nevus are pigmented growth on or in the eye which are made up of melanocytes. They, can, they are benign tumors which can be congenital or acquired. So the benign pigmented lesions of the eyelid include congenital melanocytic nevus and acquired melanocytic nevus. And the acquired melanocytic nevus are further divided into junctional, compound and intradermal. And the conjunctival melanocytic tumors include nevi which are further divided into junctional, subepithelial, compound. Uh, blue nevus and congenital melanocytosis. The second one is the primary acquired melanosis which can be with or without atypia and the third one is melanoma. So coming to the case, uh, it was a 31 year old female who presented to the oculoplastic clinic with complaints of brownish discoloration in the right eye since childhood. It was painless and gradually progressive in nature. Uh, the patient also complained of swelling in the right lower lid which was present <coughs> since three, uh, 7 to 8 years. There were no complaints of diminution of vision, pain, pricking sensation, watering or discharge. There was no uh, uh, history of trauma or ocular surgeries in the past. No similar complaints in the family and no systemic uh, comorbidities. 
coming to the examination, the patient was conscious, cooperative, well-oriented to time, place and person. Uh, there was no pallor, ictris, cyanosis, clubbing, lymphadenopathy or edema. Pulse rate and BP was normal. Uh, the systemic exam examination was normal. S1, S2 was heard. There was a bilateral normal vesicular breath sounds and uh, no focal neurological deficit. Uh, coming to the ocular examination, head posture was normal. Ocular posture was orthotropic. Uh, coming to the right eye, the vision was 6-6. Six, six. Uh, there was a non-pigmented dome-shaped swelling measuring 2 into 2 mm in the lower lid. Uh, the conjunctiva had a melanocytic uh, lesion in the intrapalpebral intra conjunctiva measuring 7 into 8 mm extending from the limbus. It was fl flat with few cystic spaces varying from tan to uh, dark brown in color. Cornea was clear, pupil was 3 mm uh, and reactive to light, lens was clear. Uh, the left side was within normal limit. Uh, the extraocular movement was full range in both eye. Gonioscopy was done, which was uh, open angles in both eye. Fundus was within normal limit. Uh, so this is the clinical picture, which shows the conjunctival lesion and a dome-shaped swelling in the lower lid and the slit lamp examination. Uh, so an ultrasound biomicroscopy of the right eye was done, which showed uh, superficial involvement without intraocular spread. Uh, coming to the management, so excision biopsy of both the lesions was done and sent for uh, histopathological analysis. Uh, the lid lesion showed uh, uh, epidermis uh, with the uh, uh, nevus cells which were uh, uh, arranged in nests with no junctional activity which was uh, uh, suggestive of intradermal nevus. Uh, this is the uh, histopath uh, uh, picture. And the conjunctival lesion showed nevus cells below the epithelium, suggestive of a subepithelial nevus. These are the histopathological uh, pictures showing the nevus cell just below the epi uh, epithelium. Uh, so these are the post-op uh, pictures, uh, post-op day 7 and post-op day 14, which showed uh, uh, complete uh, removal of the uh, pigmented lesion. So coming to the discussion. Uh, so, these lesions are very common, so clinical examination is important to differentiate between the benign and malignant lesions. Uh, definitive diagnosis is by histopathological examination and in case of conjunctival lesions, uh, UBM can be done to detect the extent and the depth of the lesion. Uh, coming to conclusion, intradermal nevus is the most common acquired melanocytic lesion in the eyelid. It is of importance to differentiate it from malignant uh, lesions like basal cell carcinoma as early diagnosis and treatment is of up, uh, utmost importance. Uh, nevi are the most common melanocytic conjunctival uh, tumors, which have a risk of uh, one person malignant transformation. And uh, this case uh, illustrates the importance of clinical and histopathological examination in accurate diagnosis. Uh, these are my references. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Was it also removed? Yes, ma'am. Both the uh, lesions were removed, the right. conjunctival lesion and the lid lesion. Mm. Uh, the lid lesion uh, showed uh, uh, it was an intradermal nevus, mm. and the conjunctival nevus showed that it was an epi, uh, subepithelial uh, melanocytic. Uh, and how do you describe the lid lesion? Uh, the lid lesion was a non-pigmented uh, uh, dome-shaped lesion, which was around 2 into 2 mm. Uh, without any pain tenderness and uh, it wasn't attached, uh, there was no uh, s um, fibrosis or anything uh, below the skin, it was freely movable. Mo oh. I guess you said some right eye, lower lip pain or something that you were presenting, right? No ma'am, there was no pain, no <laughs> symptoms, she had no symptoms of pain, only uh, her uh, main complaint was cosmetic uh, and uh, it was gradually progressive so she just wanted to uh, get it uh, examined to rule out any malignant uh, components. So what were the surgical steps that were done to remove the nevus? You didn't explain it. Uh, Ma'am, it was just uh, for the lid lesion, it was just a, f a shave biopsy. Uh, for the conjunctival lesion, it was complete uh, excision and uh, uh, the um, uh, it was just cryo which was applied after the excision uh, to the conjunctiva. No suturing, nothing was done. That should have been in and uh, what is the post operative management? Uh, post operative, we just started her on uh, 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 antibiotic and uh, lubricant, ma'am, and we waited for the uh, histopath report. So, uh, after the histopath report, after we uh, 
we were sure that it's not a malignant uh, lesion uh, we just asked her to continue the lubricant and uh, to come back to us if there is uh, uh, any other uh, any other complaints or uh, if there's a regrowth of the um, lesion thank you thank you so next is dr pankaj kataria sir uh, comparison of conjunctival autograph and sliding flap technique in primary tail gym surgery so pankaj kataria sir is there here dr pankaj kataria not there so uh, dr rajshekar dama uh, he will be presenting to us on plant latex uh, euphorbiaceae and uh, calotropis causing ocular toxicity due to accidental exposure good morning to one and all and uh, today i am presenting uh, uh, paper on plant latex causing uh, plant latex euphorbiaceae and ocular uh, calotropis causing ocular toxicity due to accidental exposure mill financial interest In introduction uh, some plant with uh, uh, pla uh, milky latex may cause ocular injuries in case of accidental contact with human eyes and these el elicit different pathogenic mechanism and different cl clinical manifestations and most commonly euphorbiaceae and calotropis family plants Euphorbiaceae on contact uh, uh, with human eyes will cause photodermatitis, conjunctivitis, mild to severe keratitis, corneal ulceration, UITs with hyperpoion, corneal scarring, meiosis, and blindness. Calotropis uh, family will cause sudden painless diminution of vision with photophobia, conjunctival congestion, mild to severe corneal edema with dismet folds, iridocyclitis associated with secondary glaucoma. And most of the cases in our study are um, treated with corticosteroid, anti-glaucoma agents, cycloplasics, hy hypotonic saline, and tear supplements. Objective of our study to determine the ocular toxicity due to ex accidental exposure to plant latex. Methodology. Uh, it, it, is a, uh, it was a prospective observational study. Uh, duration was 6 months and 32 patients are included. And, uh, Exclusion criteria is those who are not willing and uh, uh, those with pre-existing corneal pathology or opacity. Detailed history and examination of the patient was done at first presentation after copious irrigation of the eyes. Treatment was given with topical steroid antibiotic and artificial tears. Patient follow-up was done after 48 hours, 1 week and 2 week. Uh, result of our study, out of 32 patients, 20 were males, 12 were females. 13 patients came with ex exposure to calotropis uh, uh, sap and 18 patients with euphorbiaceae. One, one patient with mang uh, mango plant extract. All presented with burning and irrigation of the eye, uh, irritation of the eye. 28%, uh, 87% percent were exposed uh, while doing agricultural work and 4 while plucking flowers from calotropis. Uh, in our study, Males uh, uh, found out 62.5% of the uh, patient, uh, patient and 37.5% uh, uh, are female patients. All, uh, almost 75% uh, of the patient presented within 24 hours of 24 hours, and uh, both eye presentation was found in 48% of the cases. 87% of the cases uh, presented with burning sensation and pricking sensation of the eye. And 45% uh, of the patient uh, uh, presented with uh, six by, by 9 to 6, 18 visual loss. And 29% uh, uh, patient presented with eyelid edema, 100% patient with conjunctival congestion, and 61% patient with corneal edema and desmid folds. Uh, this picture showing uh, uh, corneal edema and desmid folds. Treatment. Uh, most of the patient in our study uh, treated with topical antibiotic and corticosteroids and tear substituents. After two days, uh, corneal edema uh, was dissipated in almost all patient of euphorbiaceae and calotropis patients, except in five patients. In five patient, corneal edema decreased in at the end of one week, and almost all regained the vision in one week. Uh, discussion: Plant uh, genus euphorbiaceae is an ornamental plant. Uh, in it is uh, used for treatment of cancer, tumor, and warts from the at least the time of Hippocrates. And Calotropis uh, uh, procedure, it found in trop uh, tropics of Asia, Africa, and Northeast of South America. And it commonly known as Madar Arakra in India. Discussion. Uh, 
KF show at all reported ocular injury caused by euphorbia and uh, sequin the initial symptoms of all patient were burning pain euphorbices have caused punctate erosion microbial and dismatch folds uh, and in uh, Ingrid U. Scott et al. reported euphorbices have caused punctate epithelopathy patient noted immediately burning, uh, burning sensation and photophobia but no visual loss. Similar observation was made but we had observed only one cases with epithelial defect and erosion. Uh, Nidhi Pandey et al. reported all patients with burning sensation and watering immediately after the accidental splashing of calotropis latex. And uh, uh, Samar K. Basak reported accidental inoculation of latex of calotropis procedure in 29 eyes. Uh, 9 had iridocyclosis associated with secondary glaucoma, but we do not have any, uh, do not see any cases with iridocyclosis and secondary glaucoma. Shivakar et al. in, uh, in their study reported they have conducted study on rat paw uh, and uh, after injection of uh, latex calotropis produces intense inflammation, inflammatory response and edema formation and cellular infiltration. This response was caused by presence of histamine in the latex itself as well as the release of mast cell histamine by the latex. Con conclusion of the study, our study, common presentation uh, were severe burning, irritation and transient loss of vision for two days to one week. Uh, farmers are more affected because of the work in agricultural field work. Uh, most of the patients are treated with uh, topical antibiotic steroids and uh, lubricating eye drops. And uh, calotropy species latex cause more ocular signs than euphorbaceous species. Thank you. These are the references. Custard apple keratitis. Um, it comes under euphorbacea, ma'am. It comes under euphorbacea. So, so for both you have treated with topical steroids. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Even the custard apple keratitis. Yes, ma'am. My doubt is like in none of your cases you had a secondary glaucoma because no, I have not seen in your medical management. No, ma'am. Almost all, uh, uh, in one week uh, regained vision and uh, cornea was clear, ma'am. Have you checked IOP for every case? Yes, ma'am. Every case I have checked. Every case IOP yes, was normal. No, ma'am. Those with epithelial defect were uh, not uh, checked, ma'am. Okay. Uh, so, Those in our setup. Those are very common. Practice in India, they have to Okay, okay. Ma'am, in PG time, I was, uh, con uh, studied this, ma'am. At that time, uh, other than GAT, uh, eye care and uh, NCT was not available, so. Up to two weeks we followed up. Yes. Oh. At the end of one week, almost all patients cleared. Me. If uh, okay, okay. Yes. Yes, okay. Thank you. Good morning everyone, today's topic of discussion is dry eyes, is it a price to pay for clear skin? There was no financial support and sponsorship and no conflict of interest. Acne vulgaris is a chronic inflammatory disorder of the pilosebaceous unit affecting 9.4% of the world's population. For severe acne, ice retinoin is the drug of choice. Although it is the most effective drug available, it affects the skin, mucosa, eyes and other systems as well. As mebomian gland is a differentiated sebaceous gland, ice retinoin can lead to mebomian gland dysfunction resulting in dry eyes. Thus, examination of dry eye parameters needs to be done to find its association with oral ice retinoin use. The aim of my study is to comprehensively analyze the association of dryness of eyes in patients on ice retinoin therapy and to assess reversibility after completion of treatment. 
It was a prospective longitudinal study from January 2023 to June 2023 and the sample size being 50 patients. We had included patients aged 18 to 40 years with severe nodular cystic acne and on isoretinoin therapy and we had excluded patients receiving other hormonal therapies notorious of dry eyes, having other systemic conditions like Jogren's or thyroid, using topical drugs affecting ocular surface, patients having history of previous trauma, ocular surgery, contact lens use, or with prolonged screen time. Using the above criteria and after taking this informed consent, 50 patients with nodular cystic acne were included in the study and their ophthalmic evaluation was done with emphasis on tear film breakup time with its normal values being more than 10 seconds and Schwammer's test one with its normal values being more than 15 millimeters in five minutes. Three readings were taken. One was at the baseline before the treatment initiation. Next was after three months of isoretinoin use and the next was after three months of treatment cessation. This is the tabulated data of the 50 patients with the TBUT values. On the frequency polygon, we can find that two out of 50 patients had below normal TBUT values at baseline. It increased to 27 out of 50 patients after three months of treatment, and it reduced to 15 out of 50 patients after treatment cessation. This is the pie chart showing the same in percentage. On calculating the mean, the baseline TBUT was 13.42 plus minus 3.08 seconds. After three months of isoretinoin use, it reduced to 9.86 plus minus 3.36 seconds. And after treatment cessation, it increased to 11.67 plus minus 3.70 seconds. These are the data of the Schwimmer's test one of the 50 patients. And on frequency polygon, we found out that 10 out of 50 patients had below normal Schwimmer's values at baseline. It increased to 36 out of 50 patients on treatment and it reduced to 32 out of 50 patients after treatment cessation. This is the pie chart showing the same in percentage. On calculating the mean, the baseline traumas was 17.02 plus minus 4.60 millimeters. After three months of isoretinoin therapy, it reduced to 11.5 plus minus 3.96 and on therapy cessation, it increased to 12.6 plus minus 4.96. Thus, the results showed significant decrease in mean TBUT and Schwammer's values during treatment with a slow increase in the parameters after discontinuation. Thus, this study infers that oral isoretinoin therapy for acne can cause dry eye disease and the effects are reversible to some extent. Studies revealed isoretinoin affect mebocyte differentiation and causes changes in mebum through PPR gamma pathway. Larger studies considering the ocular clinical features as well as other diagnostic tests are required to further authenticate these statements. Thus concluding, results suggested a positive correlation between dry eyes and oral isoretinoin use. And my take home message will be awareness among healthcare professionals and patients regarding the potential ocular side effects of isoretinoin is crucial for early detection appropriate management and optimization of patient care. These are my references. Thank you. Were there any previous studies uh, which did the same? Yes, ma'am, there were few. Yes, ma'am, there were few studies uh, done previously um, on this. Uh, same thing. Yeah, yes. And what were their results? Did they um, find a similar mm. picture or were there any different? No, ma'am, there was somewhat similar picture, but uh, the Schwarmer's values were, uh, uh, it did not decrease uh, in while on therapy, but mm -hmm. uh, in mine it showed uh, yeah. reduction. In your discussion, you need to usually include what the previous studies said and how your studies agree with the same or differ from the previous studies. Okay? Okay. Good presentation. Thank you. So next presenter is Dr. Vishal Kumar, who will be presenting on scleral patch graft in a surgically induced necrotizing scleritis after pterygium excision. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Vishal Kumar. I am going to present a case of surgically induced necrotizing scleritis after pterygium excision. 
So uh, surgical induced necrotizing sclerotis is a rare complication after any surgery involving sclera. It is a delayed hypersensitive reaction occurring due to sensitization of scleral antigens during surgery. Females are more commonly affected than males. Average age of presentation is 5th to 6th decade, commonly associated with underlying autoimmune diseases. It has commonly been repeated after a pterygium excision, uh, but cataract surgery, strabismus surgery, scleral buckling surgery, and trabeclectomy can also cause uh, scleroti necrotizing scleritis. A time of onset varies from months to years. In advanced cases, it may lead to severe pain, scleral perforation, staphyloma formation, and visual less. Uh, risk factors include excessive cauterization during surgery, use of cryotherapy, bare sclera technique of pterygium surgery, chemically induced damage with the use of antimetabolites during pterygium excision, and compression related ischemia produced by uh, scleral buckling bands, sponge, and explants. So, coming to our case, uh, he was a 53 year old man, a resident of Badaun, Uttar Pradesh. He presented to us with chief complaints of bluish discoloration of nasal side of the left eye for last six months, which was gradually increasing in size. There was no uh, any associated pain. There was no history of trauma. There was a history of pterygium excision done 15 years back at a local hospital. Uh, there was no history of any systemic illness. He had history of uh, multiple joint pains since last one year. So coming to our examination, his vision uh, in right eye was 6-6 six, six parts, in left eye it was 6-9. IOP was within normal limit in both eyes. In right eye, there was nasal pterygium present. In left eye, there was mild congestion nasally. And there was, uh, in sclera, there was bluish discoloration with uh, 3 into 1.5 mm scleral thinning with UVL tissue prolapse. Rest of the findings were normal. So this is the clinical picture uh, of the same patient. As we can see here, there is uh, thinning of the sclera with uh, 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 UVL tissue prolapse. A associative picture is also showing the same. There is uh, gross thinning of the sclera uh, uh, at the uh, nasal side. So coming to our investigation, we have sent a rheumatological consultation for that patient. Uh, a battery of investigations we had done, X-ray bilateral hands and wrists, X-ray bilateral ankles, X-ray chest, routine blood investigation, CVC with ESR, LFT, RFT which came normal, anti-CCP antibodies which were normal, rheumatoid factor came positive for this patient, viral marker, serum, IgG and uh, anti-nuclear antibody were normal. So uh, in rheumatology department they made a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis and they started on the treatment of uh, tablet Vizolone 60mg OD. Uh, so we made, we also made a provisional uh, diagnosis of surgically induced necrotizing scleritis and we, uh, we planned a treatment of scleral tectonic patch graft. This was the post-op treatment, prednisolone phosphate 1% 4 times, moxifloxacin TDS, CMC eye drops, tablet visolone and tablet pan 40. And it, this is the surgical video of the same. So first uh, st uh, stay suture was put with the vicryl suture uh, to maintain the globe in uh, uh, position and uh, to increase the exposure. Next, uh, peritomy was done at the site and uh, gentle wet cautery was done. Uh, we measured the size of the defect using caliper and uh, we used a glycerin preserved sclera for this patient and uh, appropriate size was cut uh, using scissors. and it was kept over the defect and proper sizing was again done. Now we suture it, it with uh, Tangiro nylon suture, uh, approximately 18 sutures were put and uh, peritomy was uh, closed using vicryl suture and the glue was also applied. So this is the day one picture of the same patient and, and on the right side is a three months post-op picture. As we can see uh, the defect is closed. So coming to the diagnostic approach of uh, surgical induced necrotizing uh, scleritis, we have to take a proper past medical history including autoimmune, endocrinologic and history of any collagen vascular disease and past history of any oc uh, ocular trauma, uh, dry eye disease, chronic blepharitis, conjunctival scarring or any surgery should be taken. Ophthalmological evaluation included slit lamp uh, evaluation and other investigations such as ASOCT can be done. 
and if we are suspecting any infectious uh, pathology we have to send for bacterial fungal or uh, cultures as well as atypical mycobacteria if we are suspecting if there is no infectious suspicion we have to uh, send for rheumatological invest, uh, consultation and do a battery of investigation which includes cbc blood chemistry esr crp vdrl uh, rheumatoid factor etc so management mainly consists of medical and surgical management uh, initial cases can be ma managed medically if we are suspecting any infectious pathology we have to start antibiotics or antifungal corticosteroids can be started uh, oral uh, or topical corticosteroid matrix metallo uh, proteinase inhibitors can be given biological agents such as anti tnf tnf alpha agents can also be used surgical management can be can be also done in advanced cases surgical debridement in case of infective cases and uh, for like in like in our cases tectonic uh, scleral patch graft can be done so take home message for this case was detailed past history and rheumatological conditions are important for the diagnosis of the patient it can have devastating outcomes if not detected early uh, surgical induced necrotizing sclerosis may be a complication of any surgery hence risk stratification before having a class surgery is mandatory medical and surgical management must be tailored to an individual case basis thank you Pterygium surgery was done around 15 years back at mm -hmm. a local hospital in uh, at his native place. Do you think both are related, or could it have happened without the pterygium surgery also, since the patient was RA positive? RA yeah, positive. It, it could happen, but uh, in surgically induced necrotizing sclerosis, if there is autoimmune condition, any surgery over the sclera might predis predispose to surgically induced necrotizing. His other eye also has pterygium, but he did not develop any. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, necrotizing sclerosis in other eye. So we made a diagnosis of surgical induced. Surgical induced. Because in rheumatoid arthritis patients, you can yeah. find scleritis, yeah, scleromalacia yeah, perforans without any surgery as well. Yes. Okay. But you are giving a past history of 15 years now. So after 15 years, because of uh, bare excision, probably that must have only have been happened. Cause. Uh, uh, this uh, this kind of uh, picture in literature ma'am they have given around 20 30 years after any surgery so okay. so how would you go with the tapering of the steroids and what is the policy names regarding actually that? that oral steroid was started by uh, rheumatology people they tapered uh, two weekly tapering was done in this patient and for topical steroid weekly tapering was done by us for mm -hmm. and then we continued for od dose for around two months no cyclomion drops. No, we haven't started. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Next is by Dr. Jitender, who will be presenting on ocular cicatrial pemphigoid in younger age. We need to lower down our diagnostic threshold. Good morning. Uh, I will be uh, presenting my case series of ocular cicatricial pemphigoid in young age. Do we need to lower down our diagnostic threshold? So there are no financial disclosures or no conflict of interest. So as we know that mucous membrane pemphigoid is a rare autoimmune subepithelial blistering condition which involves mucosa throughout the body, namely conjunctiva, larynx, oral mucosa, and other, uh, other sites. So classically, this disease has been described as a disease of old age, like it can present between 30 to 90 years of age, and the peak age of onset of the disease is after 70 years. However, there are few case reports which suggest that the disease can present in early age also. There are total uh, li like 10 to 14 uh, number of cases which has been uh, reported in the literature till date. So this is a retrospective case series uh, in which we recruited the patient for, uh, who were diagnosed as ocular MMP at our uh, department uh, and is less than 30 years between the, uh, 2021 to 2023. So we, need to we, we noted down their visual acuity, demographic, clinical features, clinical staging, and we uh, send the biopsy uh, conjunctival or oral mucosal biopsy for them. And the final diagnosis of OCP was confirmed with the help of immunohistopathology or clinical phenotype. So this is another uh, important uh, clone, uh, scoring system, cicatrizing conjunctive actis score, which has been described by Swapna Sanbhag et al. We say that if you take careful medical history and clinical examination, we can rule out Steven Johnson syndrome as a cause of cicatrizing conjunctivitis as compared to uh, as we can differentiate SDS from an another known SDS causes. So we send blood, rep uh, blood reports to for indirect immunofluorescence, and we send bi biopsies 
for routine histopathology to rule out other clinical conditions like OSSN, uh, keratoconjunctivitis, allergic keratoconjunctivitis, cygo, etc. So the, the direct you know, immunofluorescence is the hallmark test, is the gold standard test which proves the uh, presence of uh, ocular M MMP. So basically, uh, Foster et al. Uh, has described that the diagnostic criteria for diagnostic OMMP is uh, either a positive conjectival DIF or uh, DIF from the any other mucosal site, or a negative DIF, but a positive indirect immunofluorescence from blood, or even DIF and IF are not present, but the typical phenotype of progressive conjectival scarring is there, and we have ruled out the other causes of the scarring conjunctivitis. We can make the diagnosis of OCP. So these are the all seven patients we have diagnosed uh, in the less than 30 years of age. The youngest patient uh, was uh, a 30, 13 year old female and the uh, eldest patient was 28 year old male. So most of the patients, uh, they were uh, presenting in the advanced stage like stage three or four of foster staging, but few of them were in the stage one also. And uh, uh, five out of seven patients, they had oral mucosal involvement in addition to the conjunctiva and one patient has nasal, nasal ulcer also. So cicatrizing conjunctivitis score was very, uh, you know, suggestive of known SAS causes, like it was ranging from minus one to zero to plus one. So we could prove that uh, DI DIF, uh, we could prove the DIF based diagnosis in six out of seven patients. And most of the patient required a strong kind of immunosuppressive therapy in the form of oral azathioprine or mycophenolate mofetil. But some of the patient, they were so, you know, uh, they, they were so non-responding to the routine treatment and they required IV rotuximab or IV pulse cyclophosphamide or even IV methylprednisolone at times. So uh, some of the patient required surgical intervention uh, in the form of am amniotic membrane grafts and uh, uh, few of the patient, they were like, uh, uh, had recurrence also in the uh, follow-up and they required a stronger immunosuppressive therapy in the form of rituximab. So this is an index case just to uh, describe how we uh, treat this patient. This, this is 13 year old female who presented with severe foreign body sensation, dryness from last one year, and she had excessive irritation of eyes with photophobia from last three months. She visited multiple hospitals throughout the northern, uh, nor northern part of country, but she did not report any kind of improvements. Again, when she presented to us, she was having six by 18 vision in both eyes with zero scoring of TBAT and SERMA test. And we tried to treat her for the all kind of uh, dry treatment, including artificial tear, topical steroid, topical cyclosporin, autologous serum for one month. But uh, again, there was no uh, uh, reports of improvement from this patient. Again, the patient developed recurrent epithelial defect also. So at this time, we thought of uh, rule out some kind of uh, autoimmune diseases, but the, the workup was an, again inconclusive from the rheumatological side. So by the end of one month, this patient started developing some congenital fibrosis. So this, at this time, we got a clue that this patient uh, might have some kind of, uh, you know, uh, mucous membrane form figure. See, we referred the patient to the dermatology department. They, uh, they sent oral mucosal biopsy. The bar oral mucosal biopsy was positive for uh, immunoglobulins deposits at the basement membrane zone, which is characteristic of uh, MMP. So she was started on oral steroid along with the topical steroid antibiotics, and she responded dramatically, symptomat symptomatically. Uh, Visual equity improved to 6 by 9 in both eyes, but the TBAT and CIRMARS were still uh, maintaining zero. The ocular surface staining was persisting, and that we started the patient as a therapy. So this is the 18-month follow-up of the patient. Now the patient is 6 by 6 with cross contact lenses in both eyes. And uh, she has started developing, uh, you know, uh, having improvement in the TBAT and Sharma score, but the patient is still on 2.5 milligram dose of oral steroid and as a therapy. But the patient is maintaining a symptom-free stage. So this is another patient. I, uh, I will not go into details of each and every patient, but this is another patient. She was 16-year-old female. She was having conjectural congestion and cornea, neovasculation cornea, and we treated the patient on the same lines. This is another patient who presented with a very severe corneal thinning with a corneal melt kind of picture in the left eye. Again, the patient was uh, having conjectival biopsy, and she was, he was positive. The patient was managed on uh, uh, rituximab. So this is a similar case who presented ha having a ring, sterile ring infiltrate kind of uh, keratitis. So he was diagnosed with uh, keratitis elsewhere. Then we could, uh, you know, uh, prove that this was ocular MMP. So the patient responded nicely. So this is another case. So I would uh, suggest that classically MMP has been described in the old age, but young, in the young age, the patients uh, uh, should be treated. They should be diagnosed. So we should maintain a lower threshold for diagnosing ocular MMP in the young age so that in long term we can prevent severe blinding sequelae if diagnosed and treated timely. Thank you, sir. It was very informative for us. Uh, 
So the next presenting author will be Dr. Rohit Kumar Kompany, who will be presenting on a case series of OSS and treatment with only topical uh, therapy, chemotherapy. Good morning everyone. Today my topic of presentation is on case series of ocular surface squamous neoplasia treatment with only topical chemotherapy. So this is the outline. Coming to the introduction, as you all know, the conjunctival and corneal dysplasia along with squamous cell carcinoma constitute the spectrum of ocular surface squamous neoplasia and invasive ocular surface squamous neoplasia. For all these, previously surgical excision was found to be the gold standard, but it has high recurrences uh, chances. So from the last 10 years, there has been a shift from the surgical to topical chemotherapy alone or as an adjuvant therapy along with the surgery. So coming to the risk factors, of all the risk factors, older age and male gender was found to have the strongest association along with other history of OSS and ultraviolet exposure and prior skin cancer. So the aim of the study is to determine the effectiveness of topical 5-fluorouracil 1% as a primary treatment of ocular surface squamous neoplasia. So patient and methods. This is a cl clinical study that is conducted in Kamlan Institute of Medical Sciences, Narkat Palli, over a period of 8 months with 10 patients as a whole, ra age ranging from 30 to 80 years. So all the patients with ocular surface squamous neoplasia with tumor size of less than 4 millimeters were included and the patients with tumor size greater than 4 millimeters or patients having recurrent lesions were excluded. So these patients were clinically diagnosed and monitored by slit lamp examination along with the anterior segment optical coherence tomography. So all these patients were treated according to Mudhvirappa et al. study constituting topical chemotherapy 5-fluorouracil 1% topically 4 times per day for 1 week followed by a drug holiday of 3 weeks this constitutes 1 cycle. So the treatment continued till there was complete resolution confirmed which is clinically with anterior segment optical coherence tomography. The incidence of various side effects were also monitored and the patients were followed up for a period of 3 months. So this is a case one which is showing the presence of uh, uh, elevated lesion present over the nasal side of the limbus and uh, the OCT which is corresponding with the uh, mass which is showing hyperreflective mass present which uh, with demarcation of uh, the abnormal and abnormal epithelium seen. So after the cycles which were three the patient completely had a resolution of the mass and the OCT was found to be normal. This is the second case with the initial picture showing before the administration of topical chemotherapy and the second one is during the cycle and the last one is after the completion of three cycles and the corresponding anterior segment images can be seen, OCT. And this is the third case where we can see the presence of uh, leukoplakic type of uh, OSS and rather to the nas nasal side of the limbus and uh, on uh, corresponding AS OCT we can see the mass present and post cycle there is resolution of the mass present. This is also another case. So coming to the results, in a patient total number of 10 patients the middle age was found to be have uh, 54.8 years. And uh, coming to the gender, the males are most common uh, people with have and the prediction of 80% and uh, most of the all of the cases were unilateral in case. And uh, vision which is uh, in most than 77% of patients have uh, more than 6 by 60 vision and only 3 patients have less than 6 by 6, 6 by 60 which the, as the OSSN does not cause any hindrance to the vision, the vision was found to be normal and these patients have some other related factors like uh, 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 senile uh, cataracts, so the vision was less than 6 by 60. So coming to the risk factors, the excessive sun exposure which was found to be the most uh, associated along with old age uh, in the along among the risk factors and uh, so other associated are immunocompromised states like HIV, associated infections and uh, smoking and prior skin lesions were also have, uh, in one patient and the coming to the symptoms, the patients have more for foreign body sensation in 43% and other patients have watering and chronic redness. So coming to the side effects of 5-fluorouracil, conjunctival hyperemia was found to be the most common side effect which was found in 30% of patients Associ and other side effects are irritation, photosensitivity and watering and superficial punctate keratopathy was found in only one patient. So these are the other studies which shows uh, uh, Raphael Peperosi et al which has 45 patients and the drug delivery was topical and uh, mean uh, median number of cycles were one cycle and recurrence rates were found to be 7.3%. And uh, the side effects was as uh, same as our study as conjunctival hyperemia. The other is uh, Nandini Venkateshwaran et al, which has 25 patients and uh, topical dose of drug delivery. And the median cycles were 2.4 cycles and the recurrence rate was 3.3 percent according to that study. And the photosensitivity was the most common side effect. And Madhura G et al, with 13 patients and uh, median number of cycles were 2 cycles, the recurrence rate was 2.5 percent and conjunctival hyperemia was a common side effect. 
in mudvirappa at all the topical therapy was given and uh, three si- median cycles were three in number and recurrence rate was found to be zero as a, uh, as an r study and conjunctival hyperemia and photosensitivity were common side effects associated so coming to the discussion as we all know ossn range from simple dysplasia to invasive squamous cell carcinoma involving the cornea conjunctiva and the limbus it is clinical appearance is very typical and uh, ocd showing hyperreflective thickened epithelium with an abrupt transition between the normal and cancerous epithelium surgical excision with no touch technique and base cryotherapy has the disadvantages of iatrogenic limbal stem cell deficiency and high chances of recurrences and the topical chemotherapy was used as a sole therapy in our study five fluorouracil spreads all over the ocular surface kills the neoplastic cells which are invisible to the naked eye so the five fluorouracil is a structural analog of thymidine which inhibits the dna formation by blocking the enzyme thymidylate synthase so these tumor cells which are rapidly multiplying require more amount of dna than the normal cells and these take up the f- amounts of 5 fluorouracil allowing the selective targeting destruction of cancerous cells the advantages include shorter duration of treatment no refrigeration required and remain stable at 25 degrees and it is very less expensive and the patients prefer taking the one week per month treatment than rather than daily administration all the tumor resolve completely after the mean of three monthly cycles and no recurrences were noted in our study so conclusion in our study topical 5 fluorouracil as a sole therapy was found to be safe and effective modality for patients having ossn and wanting medical management avoiding the risk of repeated surgical intervention the limitations include a small sample size and in advanced case of ossn topical chemotherapy alone would not would only help in chemo reduction but not suffice the whole treatment also the shorter duration of follow up these are my references thank you what are the other drugs that can be used uh, the, the other drugs which are useful are uh, mitomycin ma'am yes. and interferon ma'am uh, mm. which are commonly used uh, but uh, they must be used for uh, daily administration it is mer- little expensive compared to the 5 fluorouracil ma'am so and also the amount of administration is uh, co- relatively less compared to other 5 uh, fluorouracil and other drugs ma'am they need to be administered daily this is only for one week ma'am okay. and what is the type of your study uh basically it is a clinical study on uh, retrospect it, it is a prospect uh, uh, prospect type of clinical study anything else Obs- was it observational or interventional interventional yeah. Yeah. that should be mentioned okay. in your type of study and clinically is there any staining procedure which can help you delineate the extent of the lesion yes ma'am which um, which stain do you use Which type of OSS and responded better with your medical management? Was there any classification on that? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, leukoplakic variety was most commonly observed in our study, ma'am. Okay. Uh, this was commonly treated. Till what size was the OSS in responding to medical therapy, and after that, uh, after up to a up to a size of three mm, it was found to be responsive, ma'am. Greater than three mm, it required both surgical and uh, other medical management along with five fluorouracil. Should have been there on your side. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. The next presenter is Dr. Arushi Saini, who will be presenting to us on comparative evaluation of ocular surface health in thyroid disorder with or without eye signs. Good morning, everyone. The title of my presentation is Comparative Evaluation of Ocular Surface Health in Patients with Thyroid Disorder, both with and without eye signs. I have no financial disclosures. Introduction, a uh, dry eye can be divided into three types based on the mechanism behind it. It can be an aqueous deficiency dry eye due to decreased tear production, hyper evaporative type in which there is more eva- evaporation from the ocular surface or a combination of two. Further tests can be done to differentiate which type of dry eye is present. Ocular surface inflammation and increased tear osmolarity can occur in both these types of dry eyes. Thyroid disorder has been associated with dry eye in the literature and the most common cause is given as evaporative dry eye due to the thyroid eye signs like lid retraction and decreased blink rate. Other than that, ocular inflammation, lacrimal gland dysfunction, meibomian gland dysfunction and corneal hypoesthesia have also been listed at cause, as causes of dry eye. Uh, in our study, we included patients with thyroid disorder, both hyperthyroidism as well as hypothyroidism. Exclusion criteria included subjects with any systemic illness known to affect ocular surface like Jogren syndrome, history of any ocular surgery, contact lens use, active infection or using topical medications that can cause dry eye. 
material and methods we took a total of 90 subjects 30 were controls which were age and gender matched and taken from the IOPD of GTB hospital 30 patients with thyroid disorder with eye signs and 30 patients with thyroid disorder without any prominent eye signs all the subjects underwent detailed ocular and systemic examination with assessment of eye signs and thyroid disorder under informed consent the patients filled an OSDI questionnaire in the confidential setting a tear film breakup time was done along with basal secretion test and Schirmer's one test. They also underwent impression cytology in which a cellulose acetate filter paper was used to impression the conjunctiva and a pass staining was later done. Tear ferning was also done which uh, and the tears were collected using a glass tube and were spread on a clean glass slide and assessed. So the tear ferning grading used in our study had grade at four grades in which we considered grade one and two as normal. A good ferning pattern was obtained in, in the normal grades and grade three and four were abnormal having a fragmented tear ferning or no tear ferning at all. Tear ferning is an indicator of the tear film uh, structure and osmolarity and in cases of mucin deficiency abnormal tear ferning can be obtained. Impression cytology is an indicator of ocular surface health and inflammation. We considered grade 0 and 1 normal in our study in which there were presence of good number of goblet cells as well as small and round epithelial cells. Increase in the size of the epithelial cells and decrease in number of the goblet cells indicated poor, uh, indicated an abnormal conjunctival impression cytology as can be seen here. Coming on to the results, first we compared thyroid disorder with controls. A significantly severe Schirmer's 1, BST and TBUT was seen in the thyroid disorder group as can be seen in the bar charts with a dark blue color showing abnormal grades. Then higher percentage of abnormal grades were seen in thyroid disorder with respect to tear ferning and impression cytology but these were not statistically significant. We next compared thyroid disorder with eye signs versus thyroid disorder without any eye signs. A significantly higher OSDI score was seen in the eye signs group indicating that symptoms of, thyro symptoms of eye disease were more common in, eye disease, in thyroid eye disease group. Uh, higher severity of Schirmer 1, BST and TBUT grades were seen in the eye signs group but these were not statistically significant. Abnormal grades of tear ferning were also more common in eye signs group but not statistically significant. However, impression cytology was found to be significantly abnormal in the eye disease group as can be seen in the bar chart indicating that ocular surface inflammation has a major role to play in eye disease group. Summarizing, when we compared thyroid disorder versus controls, we found Schirmer's 1, BST and TBUT to be significantly abnormal uh, and both these tell that aqueous secretion as well as evaporative dry eye have a role to play in thyroid disorder. In our study, we found a more significant association with Schirmer's 1 and BST telling that aqueous secretion dry eye is prominently present in thyroid disorder group. When we compared eye signs group versus no eye signs, impression cytology was the only test to be found significantly abnormal between the two groups indicating that eye signs had eye, the patient with eye signs had a ocular surface inflammation which was less in which was less in patients of no eye signs conclusion our study suggests that patients with thyroid disorder had higher prevalence of dry eye compared to controls both evaporative and aqueous deficiency dry eye contribute to the pathogenesis in our study evaporative dry eye was more significantly linked to thyroid disorder Patients with thyroid eye signs had significantly more abnormality in impression cytology compared to those without eye signs. It suggests that ocular inflammation can play a major role in such patients as compared to those without eye signs. Thank you. Did anybody have exposure keratitis in your group? Uh, no ma'am, we no. didn't take patients of lag of thalmos. There were patients with There were patients, but we did not include them in did this. Not include. They were excluded. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, does did anybody have superior limbic keratoconjunctivitis? Yes, ma'am. They were included in this. Study. They were included. Yes. Right. How many patients? Ma'am, approximately uh, ten percent patients of the total thyroid patients had superior limbic keratoconjunctivitis. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. We conclude the session. Actually, uh, we were asked to judge the best paper of the session. So we actually narrowed down on three best papers. Um, Dr. Darshna Ravi Kumar, uh, Dr. Vishal Kumar, and Dr. Jitender. Uh, but we need to just have one winner for that, actually. So uh, Dr. Vishal Kumar, the, uh, because we really didn't feel that much convinced that it is uh, 
know, like it is caused due to bare sclera technique. So we might feel that, like we feel that it might be due to scleromalacia perforance also. So that was the one thing that we couldn't get convinced of. And uh, Dr. Jitender had an excellent presentation, but the only thing uh, which went against it was that he overshot the time. So we have to give it to Dr. Darshana Ravikumar as the clear winner of this session. So uh, Dr. Darshana will be competing with uh, Dr. Uh, Nirlpita Dash, who, uh, is she there? She'll be presenting on dry eye and meibomian gland dysfunction in patients of allergic conjunctivitis in coastal area. So Dr. Darshana, you need to present again after she completes her presentation so we can have one clear winner of the session. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, I would request Dr. Rajesh Sinha sir and Dr. Ramesh Bhubligar and Dr. Sunil sir to please judge the session. We are very juniors to you sir, please. Should I start? Allergic conjunctivitis and dry eye disease are highly variable and two most common ocular surface inflammatory disorders. These disorders have been regarded as the epidemics of the 21st century, affecting the quality of life of people. Results of quality of life studies have shown that the impact of moderate to severe dry eye can be similar to that of moderate to severe angina. Now why this study? Dry eye hinders the removal of allergenic antigens in the ocular surface, which exacerbates allergic conjunctivitis. Similarly, allergic conjunctivitis has been shown to disrupt the tear film stability, contributing to worse outcomes in patients with dry eye. These negative interactions between the two diseases necessitate bidirectional diagnosis and management to prevent chronic damage to the ocular surface. My aims and objectives were to study the prevalence of dry eye in clinically diagnosed patients of allergic conjunctivitis, to study the prevalence of meibomian gland dysfunction in patients of allergic conjunctivitis. Materials and methods, it was an observational cross-sectional study which was conducted from June to July 2023. 32 patients having the chief complaints of itchiness and redness in the eyes were included in the study of taking proper written informed consent. In pediatric patients, consent was taken from the parents or guardian. My inclusion criteria was clinically diagnosed cases of allergic conjunctivitis having the chief complaints of itching and redness aged from 7 to 60 years. And exclusion criteria was patients on any topical medication, history of contact lens wear, history of refractive surgery or any other ocular surgery, history of ocular trauma, corneal pathology, systemic diseases like diabetes, collagen vascular disease, hypertension, and on medications like immunosuppressants and isotretinoin. My methods of evaluation consisted of OSDI scores, Tremor 1 test, TF beauty, and slit lamp evaluation for meibomian gland dysfunction. Now these were my results. The male to female ratio was 12 to 20. And uh, we can see that females outnumbered uh, the males. The perineal allergic conjunctivitis was found in 28.12% of patients, seasonal allergic conjunctivitis in 53.12%, and VKC in 18.75%. According to the OSDA scores, 18%, uh, 18 patients had normal OSDA scores, 10 patients had mild dry eye, and 4 patients had moderate dry eye. Uh, the mean OSDA scores was found to be significantly higher in patients of perineal allergic conjunctivitis, which was 20.33 plus or minus 7.22 standard deviation, and the p-value was found to be statistically significant, that is less than 0.001. According to TF Beauty, eight patients of dry eye having a TF Beauty of less than 10 seconds, which included four patients of perineal allergic conjunctivitis, three patients of seasonal, and one patient of VKC. And according to the Shermo 1 test, 10 patients of dry eye having a value of less than 10 millimeter in five minutes, which included five patients of perineal, four of seasonal, and one of VKC. Now coming to meibomian gland dysfunction, out of the 32 patients that we had taken, 11 had associated meibomian gla uh, gland dysfunction, which included seven of perineal allergic conjunctivitis alone. And of these, four patients had grade one dysfunction, five had grade two, and two patients had grade three. Now my outcome was allergic conjunctivitis was found to be more common in females, of which seasonal allergic conjunctivitis was more common. Perineal allergic conjunctivitis has a higher prevalence of dry eye followed by seasonal and then VKC. 
And in our study, out of the 32 patients, 10 had mild dry eye disease, 4 moderate, based on the OSDI scores. Mevomian gland dysfunction was significantly found in the perineal allergic conjunctivitis patients at a 77.8%, indicating its association with the chronicity of the disease. The limitations of my study were it was a cross-sectional study, not longitudinal, had a small sample size, duration of the study was small, and uh, mebography was not done. Coming to the discussion part, TFOS DWS2 has identified allergic conjunctivitis as a probable risk factor for dry eye disease. Similar findings have been found in other studies of seasonal allergic conjunctivitis being the most common. Mazumdar et al. had a similar inference of perineal allergic conjunctivitis having a higher prevalence of dry eye. Prevalence of dry eye in our study differed from other studies, and this decrease in prevalence could be due to climatic variations as our region had high humidity. Conclusion, ocular allergy contributes to TFM hyperosmolarity, ocular surface inflammation and damage, all of which are key mechanisms in the vicious cycle of dry eye disease. Nebomian gland dysfunction is a major long-term complication of allergic conjunctivitis. The inflammation response, continuous mechanical stress induced by chronic eye rubbing in allergic conjunctivitis are presumed to be associated with the onset of mebomian gland dysfunction. Therefore, allergic conjunctivitis patients need to be screened for dry eye disease even if after the resolution of symptoms and associated mebomian gland dysfunction needs to be treated in order to improve their quality of life. Thank you, everyone. So what I have observed is in those patients, they have a chronic uh, disease affecting them and they have a habit of rubbing their eyes constantly. And they are constantly, in my area that I did, they were constantly exposed to those allergens. So there was a constant uh, posterior blepharitis which was found in them. So that could have led to obstruction and bebomian gland dysfunction. So. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My topic for today is impact of eye care training program on the knowledge, attitude and practice of intensive care unit nurses. We have no financial conflicts of interest. Eye care is the fundamental constituent for preventing blindness. In the ICU, where life is in major dispute due to severe systemic illness and injuries, patients are under life supportive measures including the CPAP, uh, posture pressure ventilation, anesthetic agents, all of them impair the blink reflex leading to lag of thalmos, ultimately leaving the ocular health compromised. Hence, minimal priority is given to eye care. Therefore, the primary care provider or the nurse needs to be assessed regarding his or her skills to help improve eye care in patients who are admitted in the ICU. Our main aim of the study is to evaluate the ICU nurses of the knowledge, attitude and practice to make a protocol for eye care in an ICU setting and to assess its impacts. Though there were many studies done in this regard, most of them lacked in their sample size and a very few studies are conducted in India. Coming to methodology, it was a prospective cross-sectional study conducted in MS Ramya Medical College for a period of four months from October 2022 to January 2023. We have a sample size of 196. Uh, we included all the ICU nurses working in Ramya Hospital at present and excluded the nurses who declined to give consent for the survey. Moving on to the procedure, uh, we, uh, we administered a questionnaire based data collection tool. It was a mixed type of questionnaire, both open and closed end questions were given and they were given 20 minutes to answer the question. We, for the ease of conducting the training session, we had divided them into batch of 25 members. It was a training program, a lecture based training program and also a demonstration of how ocular medications need to be installed and how eyelid taping is supposed to be done. It was followed by a post training assessment after two weeks where 141 nursing staff participated and data analysis was done using the SPSS database tool. The results, the mean uh, age was 33 years with female staff nurses higher than the males. Majority of the nurses pursued a BSc in nursing followed by 42% 40, diploma and 2% MSc and mean years of experience in, in ICU in general was 7 years. 
the years of experience in ophthalmology department was very less with 89% having no experience, 9% have less than one year of experience and only 2% worked up to one year or more. The knowledge was assessed in terms of how familiar they were with the science of recognizing eye infection. 45% already possessed the knowledge, whereas 14% noticed only after ophthalmology referral was given and 41% were ignorant of the signs. Post training, 63% were uh, able to detect or uh, recognize an eye infection. Before training, 30% were able to do a dry eye assessment, whereas after training, 69% were able to do a dry eye assessment. In view of eye taping, 79% were unaware prior to the training, whereas 67% came to know about it following the session. With respect to attitude, questions were based on what were the factors preventing adequate eye care. Most of them submitted to the fact that they had lack of knowledge, followed by it is not an important job. Uh, remaining proportion of the nurses felt that either there was lack of time or too much documentation or too much work. Coming to discussion, in our current study, 63% of nurses had poor knowledge about eye care in ICU initially. Previous studies of Fashafshi et al, Algamd et al also reported poor knowledge, whereas Vyas et al and Khalil et al reported sound knowledge of nurses. Only 21% of the participants had good practice, which was consistent with the finding of Lamy et al, Fashafshi et al and Khalil et al. 59% felt eye care was not an important job, that is it had a negative attitude which was reinforced by Gamla Mohamed et al. The results had increased significantly post-intervention and overall the training program was able to improve the clinical capability of ICU nurses in providing adequate eye care to the ICU patients. Coming to the conclusion, eye care among the intensive care nursing staff is suboptimal. So with a structured eye care training program, we can improve the knowledge, the attitude and the practice among the ICU nurses. We can reduce the incidence of avoidable blindness and win the love and gratitude of the patients and the caregivers. These are my references. Thank you. We have to follow them um, after six months or every year to see if they are uh, after the questionnaire. Uh, it looks like their knowledge and attitude, everything is changing. So whether it is consistent or are they going back to their normal, we have to go and assess them once again. Thank you.